Game Devs, welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Dee, and today we're diving into part 2 of building a state machine in Godot. In the last video, we set up a basic state machine to handle player movement. In this video, we'll quickly recap by adding an attack state, then bring in animations for each state and implement a system to unlock the abilities we created before, like dashing and now attacking. If you missed the first video, check it out if you want to get up to speed, but if you're familiar with state machines and how they work, let's jump right in. In part 1, we set up a state machine using empty nodes for each state. Idle state, moving state, jumping state, and dashing state, and connected them to our player movement logic in the player state control script. This helped keep our code modular and easy to expand. First, let's add an empty node for the attack state in our state machine and add a script to it. This script will need to extend the base class player state and we add a variable for the attack duration and set it to something like 0.5. This will be the duration of the attack and an attack timer and set it equal to zero. As we did before, we call super to call the parent class method. I explained that in greater detail in part one of the series. Next, set the attack timer equal to the attack duration and call the attack function, which in this case, I will just print entered attack state for simplicity. In the handle input function, I will call an update state function, which will simply count down the attack by delta. And if the attack timer is less than or equal to zero, then change the player state back to the idle state. Before we move on, we need to set up the input for the attacking state as we did for the dashing state before. I will set the input for attacking to the C key on the keyboard. With that done, in the idle state script, we can use an else if statement to check if the attack was pressed and change the player's state to the attacking state to be able to attack from the idle state. I think that it would be pretty cool to attack while jumping as well. So, in the jumping script, I will also add an else if statement to check if the attack was pressed to change the attacking state here as well. And just like that, we've added a new attacking state to our player. Now let's start setting up our animations. For that, I will need to change the player sprite because my cute girl here does not have an attack animation or a dash animation. So I will now be using this adventurer. I will leave a link to it in the description. And again, for simplicity, I will just use sprite frames to set up the animations for idle, moving, jumping, dashing, and attacking. Let me quickly walk you through the setup of the idle animation. First we will need to change the player sprite from a sprite to the node to an animated sprite to the node. Then in the inspector we click on sprite frames and this opens up the sprite frames tab at the bottom of the window. Rename the default animation to idle and click on the add frames from sprite sheet button. We can then change the size of the grid or add the number of horizontal and vertical frames so that the frames are adjusted properly. And choose the frames for the idle animation. This sprite is way smaller than the previous one. So in the inspector under transform, I will adjust its scale. Now that that's done, it looks really blurry. Let's fix that. Go to project, project settings, rendering, texture, and change it to nearest. Let's move the collision shape above the animated sprite in the tree so we can see the sprite clearer. We can see that this cleared up the pixels nicely. We will set the animation to loop and autoplay. In the player state control script, we need to change the reference to the player sprite from sprite 2D to animated sprite 2D. All we need to do is repeat this process for the other animations. The only difference being that we may need to adjust the speed and disable auto start and loop. Now, 
when we play the game, we can see that the idle animation works fine. Now that we have the animations set up, let's take a look at refactoring the code to handle switching the animations when we are switching the states. This is going to be really, really easy, since all we need to do is add a function to the player state control script to play the animation and pass in the name of the animation to be played. And because we already have a reference to the animated sprite 2D called player sprite, we just need to call the play function on the animation that we would like to play. And for each state, we add the appropriate line of code in the enter state function for each state. Okay, okay, I know that was a bit much, but let's take a closer look. We already looked at the idle state where we called the play function on the idle animation. So let's take a look at the move state next. When we first set up the move state, there was no real need to have an enter state since the movement was being handled in the player state control script. But now that we are setting up the animations, we'll need to introduce an enter state to play the moving animation. I guess you can see where I'm going with this. We just need to call player.playAnimation in each of the states for each of the animations we want to call. In the jump script, we call it here. In the dash script, we call it here. And in the attack script, here. And that's it. We have all our animations set up. And when we play the game, we can see our player animate. Now I do realize that we are about to go a little off topic here, but I think this would be a cool next step. Let's say that we wanted to start the game with the dash and attack abilities locked. Then during the game, unlock them with a pickup. Well, that's super easy. All we would need to do is add ability flags as booleans for can dash and can attack and set them equal to false in the player control script. That way, in the input handling function of the idle state, the jumping state and the moving state, we can add a check to see if the abilities were set to true before allowing the player to change state. That's it. It really is that simple. Then we'll need a way to set the flags to true. For this, we can use an area 2D node and check if the player entered it and unlock the appropriate ability. Let's take a look at the code. This script extends the area 2D node, which we use to detect when the player interacts with the pickup. At the top, we have two at on ready variables to get references to the sprites we want to show. A boot for the dash ability and a sword for the attack ability. These sprites are children of the area 2D node and are hidden by default. Next, we defined an enum called abilities, which acts as a cleaner way to represent our available abilities, dash and attack. Instead of using strings, enums give us type safety and clarity in our code. We also have an exported variable called ability to unlock. This lets us choose which ability the pickup will unlock directly from the inspector. So, for example, if the pickup is for the dash ability, we just need to set it to dash in the inspector. Moving on to the ready function. This is where we handle which sprite is visible when the pickup appears in the game. We use a match statement to check the selected ability. If the ability is dash, we make the boot sprite visible. If it's attack, we show the sword sprite. This ensures that only the relevant sprite is being displayed. Now the main functionality happens in the onbody entered function, which is part of the signals that an area 2D has. This is triggered whenever another physics body collides with the pickup. First, we check if the colliding body is the player by matching its name with player state controlled. This ensures that only the player can interact with the pickup. Once confirmed it's the player, we use another math statement to check the selected ability. If the ability is dash, we unlock it by setting the player's can dash property to true. Similarly, if the ability is attack, we enable it by setting can attack to true. These properties are defined in the player state control script and control whether or not the player can perform these actions. And finally, after unlocking the ability, we call Q3 to remove the pickup from the scene. 
This ensures it can't be used more than once. And that's it. The entire script. It's modular, clean, and easy to expand if you need to add more abilities in the future. And there you have it. We've come to the end of part 2 of this series. We added a new attack ability, animations, and unlocked the abilities using a state machine. If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. We discussed a lot today. Core mechanics with no gimmicks. I do hope this video was helpful. If you liked the video, give it a like. As always, subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll know when I upload another video. And speaking of my other videos, why not check out part 1 of the series here or one of my other videos. This has been Diragu Games.